people. Lots of people know about Easter. It's a big deal holiday in our country, but a lot of people think about Easter more in terms of chocolate or bunnies or a day off work than anything else. Now, don't get me wrong, I love all those things, especially bunnies, but none of those things is why Easter is a big deal. Jesus is why Easter is a big deal. Why Jesus? Well, that's the question that we're going to be asking for these next six weeks. What makes Jesus such a big deal? Uh, what does Jesus uniquely reveal about God? Why does our calendar revolve around him? Why do people put their faith in him? Why is Easter about Jesus and not bunnies when bunnies are just so much fuzzier than Jesus? I owe a big debt on this one, right up front. I owe a big debt to Pastor Mike Slaughter from Ginghamsburg Church in Ohio through this series. They preached uh, a Why Jesus series back in 2011, and I loved it. When I contacted them about working with their outlines and, and maybe teaching uh, some of their material, they blessed me to do that. They even sent me like six gigabytes of graphics files that uh, I could pick and choose from and work with as, as I made it my own. And that is just so cool of them. I, I want to put that out there right now. As we're starting out, I want to publicly acknowledge that their work is the base for this, year, for this series. It was a huge benefit to me as, uh, as we move forward this season towards Easter. So I said before, uh, mentioned that the Christian church has a name for this season. Uh, leading up to Easter. The six weeks are called Lent, and there's this tradition of preparation during that time. Why? Because people have a tendency to rush into Easter, uh, looking for celebration without digging into the depths of what Easter means and preparing our hearts to really receive again the love that God has poured out on us through Jesus Christ. So this year, as we prepare, I really want us to get to know the one who went to the cross in a deeper and more real way. So calling ourselves Christians, calling <coughs> ourselves Christians doesn't mean that we know the Christ that we claim to follow. It's easy for us to fall into this trap of, of either taking the things that we like and, and leaving the rest behind like it's some sort of buffet, or, or just taking whatever we were handed as kids and just cleaning the plate, whether we like it or not. Here, here's a man who shattered all preconceptions of what a Messiah was supposed to be, how he was supposed to talk, how he was supposed to act. Do you really want to know this man, this one, who we dare to believe is God with us? If so, the invitation is yours. Join us as we begin to ask the most important question we will ever address. Why Jesus? Who is this man? Now, we live in, in a time that morality is increasingly relative and religious diversity is increasing all around us, so I want to be intellectually honest during this whole series. We look around and it seems like there's a pretty broad range of choices. There's A through Z or none of the above, and they're all considered valid options in our culture. I don't want to attack any other religion or, or start getting really negative about any other religion, but what I do want to do is, in this really open kind of way, ask the question that's on a lot of people's hearts. How can we say that Jesus is unique from all of the other religious <coughs> leaders in the world? What makes Jesus unique? Now, one thing we can say, and, and, and you're not going to get much argument on this uh, anywhere, by the way, is that Jesus was a historical person. It's amazing how even how many other religions incorporate Jesus into their teaching or, or write about Jesus in their history. Uh, Andy Bannister, Dr. Andy Bannister works for Rabbi Zacharias Ministries. He specializes in Islamic studies. I've heard him speak about studying the Quran and, and talking to, to imams, those are Muslim pastors basically, asking these imams uh, about the fact that the Quran talks about Jesus. And the Quran says that Jesus had a virgin birth, and the Quran says that Jesus never died, and, and, and that Jesus ascended into heaven. And what do they do with this? And, and the Imam's standard reply across the board is that you can't be a good Muslim and not believe in Jesus, because Jesus is one of God's 25 prophets. 
That's their answer to who is this man. Well, credible in history, that's what we've said Jesus is here, across the board. Well, if you say that Jesus is credible, you have to say that his teachings are credible, right? And the core of Jesus' teaching was about himself. He said the kinds of things that we don't hear other religious leaders saying. He said things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that is a pretty radical kind of statement. He said things like, to see me is to see God. He said, to know me is to know God. To deny me is to deny God. Jesus said. And then you have the witness of the first Christian community, that early Christian church. And in the fourth chapter of Acts, we read this. Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's what they did with Jesus. Now, because Jesus is obviously, obviously one of the most influential persons ever to live in history, the Bible is the most widely published book, the most widely purchased book throughout history. There's no arguments about that. Many people will then fall back on well, Jesus was a good moral teacher. We heard that in, in the statements from the skate park, right at the beginning of the service. Jesus was a good moral teacher. You'll hear a lot of people say, I don't believe Jesus was God, but I believe Jesus was a good teacher, a good moral teacher. Now, here's what C.S. Lewis said about that. I'm going I'm to give a bit closer to, to a quote than, than our, our beat poet gave just before the, our, our last worship time here. Uh, he said that you can't say that Jesus was just a good moral teacher, because if Jesus was just a good moral teacher, well, then he lied about his most important teaching. He lied about the core of his teaching, his identity, who he claimed to be. So he was either a liar, which means eh, you can't really call him a good moral teacher, walking around lying about who he was all the time. If he wasn't who he said he was, he was. Or maybe he was crazy. He was, he was a lunatic. I, I've heard stories about mental hospitals and, and people wandering the hallways believing that they are Jesus Christ. That's not an uncommon delusion from what I am told. Well, Jesus could be crazy, right? That, that could, he, he could uh, believe he was Jesus. No, okay, not, not that he would believe he was Jesus and not be Jesus, but believe he was the Christ and not be the Christ. That, that's a possibility. Or, as C.S. Lewis said, I mean, a crazy person doesn't teach like that. Doesn't have that wisdom. Doesn't have that knowledge. It doesn't perform miracles. So if he's not lying about it, and if he, he's not, uh, not crazy, then there's only one other option. He was who he said he was. The risen Lord the universe. You only have three choices. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. Those are the only three choices you have once you admit to yourself and acknowledge that Jesus was an historical person. I want to dive into scripture on this. If you got your Bible with you, I invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to start at verse 53. You can follow along there, or I will have it up, up on a screen because Gang of Church has given some awesome scripture slides. Um, so you can follow along there or up there. At this point in the story, Jesus has been teaching, he's been healing, and he was really starting to make a name for himself in the whole area, in that region, when we pick up the story here. So when Jesus had, had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom, these, these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't, isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, and Joseph, and, and Simon, and, and Judas? Are his sisters here with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, only in their own home, homes and towns are prophets with their honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Do you ever feel, does it ever feel like the things that we hear and read about Jesus are just too much to believe? 
Have you ever felt like if you went back in time, you could go back and actually see Lazarus rise from the grave, that you could actually uh, share in that miraculous meal with 5,000 other people, that believing would be just easy? Well, these people witnessed the miracles, and they still rejected Jesus. As a matter of fact, we read that there are times that he did some miracles, and right after he did the miracles, the crowds asked him to leave. He said, you did some miracles, now thank you, please go away. Because Jesus was not who people expected. Now, when we picture God, when you picture God, what do you picture? During this series, we're going to have some back and forth times. We're going to have some times that I want to ask you these questions and let you dig in. When you picture God, what is your picture of God? It can be one word, it can be a sentence. Shout it out for us, please. Love. Uh, I'm thinking like a visual, like I, when, I, when I pray, a lot of times, as I'm trying to get in the headspace, I, there will be a picture in my mind. And, and I don't want to say my picture right away. I'd love to hear, hear your pictures, but. I'm sitting on a throne. A king on a throne. Yeah. yeah. What? Anybody, anybody else? His hands. Like, hands. One more, please. Okay, I mean, I'll say, like, when, when, I, when I am trying to get my head in that space to approach God, for me, it's light. Uh, just coming into this ever-increasing, ever-growing light. And from, from what I've heard, what I've read, uh, what they experienced uh, at their church, uh, People tended to have that kind of extraordinary thing, uh, uh, light or just some great power or, or the king on the throne. These are extraordinary things, not ordinary. But the problem was, what people see in Jesus is not that extraordinary. So what's really plagued Christianity, what's plagued Christianity and has plagued many religions is a Greek philosophy called, yes, Yes, it's Greek philosophy again. Uh, Greek philosophy called Platonic dualism. Uh, Plato had taught this, this, this clear separation existed, this distinction between the spiritual and the material, the spiritual and the physical. And the physical was corrupt and dirty and bad and smelly. And the opposite of the physical was the spiritual, which was good, which was complete. Uh, the physical was a reflection of the spiritual. The spiritual was what was really real. And what we see here was a shadow of that. And it was all very separate. And uh, you can see the influences of that in, in a lot of people's thinking, a lot of religion. And uh, a lot of people, even in Christianity, who believe that life is just this journey to escape the physical body and... And, and go up in higher levels of spirituality. That, uh, you know, people will say, like, when I'm going to die, they're going to plant my body, and my disembodied spirit will go up to heaven. That is Greek. That's Plato. That's not a Hebrew Christian kind of Bible. See, what's, what's so amazing is that when the gospel comes along, it says the word became flesh. The word became body. The spirit became material, became physical. And this was just disgusting to people who thought that flesh, that physical, was bad. I mean, think about the body. What is the body? I, the best description I have ever heard of the human body was from Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, to be specific. And they ran into some aliens, and the Universal Translator, because that's a thing, uh, was able to render their alien word for human as ugly bags of mostly water. <laughs> Ugly bags of mostly water. I mean, think about the body and, you know, bodily fluids and, and you know, there's, there's disposable waste and you have to feed the body and the body has aches and pains and it gets old and there's blood and aging and cancer and death. But the word became body. <coughs> Physical is not bad. Romans 8 actually says that the spirit is renewing your body. The spirit is. The Apostles' Creed says that we believe in the resurrection of the body. We, we believe 
uh, that I don't care if you've been cremated or whatever. God can put those molecules back together and raise you up at the last day. There's going to be a resurrection of the body, and we'll stand in our bodies before God on the day of judgment. Another Greek word, another Greek word that has impacted our ideas of God. This is a word we use in English a lot of the time. It's stoic. This is the concept that since the body and emotions and, and, and pain and all that kind of stuff is bad, big boys don't cry. You know, being strong means not showing an emotion. Uh, like I've, I've heard people tell their kids to man up when they're crying. That's nonsense, right? Like, that kind of nonsense has filled our society, but stoic means strong, and we see God is strong, so God must be stoic. Uh, God is devoid of emotion. And, and that was pretty typical. That's a typical thought, but here we had Jesus. So what did Jesus do? This is the shortest verse in the Bible. Can, does anybody just offhand know what the shortest verse in the Bible is? Jesus wept. Now come on, people were saying. We see you pulling off these miracles and stuff and, and, and wonder where you get that. But we knew you. We grew up with you, right? Hey, guys, I went to school with this guy. And let me tell you, oh, he was not outstanding in any single area. I'm telling you, the people that I went to school with had a different, have a different picture of me. Had a different picture of me, at least, than, than you guys do. Now, I, I can remember this one time in elementary school. I was not feeling well, and I farted in class, and it turned out not to be a fart. And what do you think, until my parents moved, I was known for at that school? That's it. That was, it was done. I had nothing else as far as what people would think about me. you got to believe me. Jesus did everything in human development that human development does. And they knew that. And that was what was so awesome about going to university. Nobody knew me. It was, it was a fresh start. It was, it was great. So what we read here is that because Jesus was so ordinary, and our pictures of God are anything but ordinary, Jesus was offensive. You see, God is easier to live with as an unseen spirit than when God becomes flesh. When Jesus becomes flesh, then you can't create God in your own image. See, as long as God is an unseen spirit, I can make Jesus anything I want Jesus to be. It's amazing how many of my personal convictions and preferences and prejudices Jesus seems to share. And I can use Jesus to defend my political views, whatever they are, liberal, conservative, whatever. Mother Teresa said it best. She said, many of us are guilty of believing in a Jesus of our imagination and not the real Jesus, the true Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, the Lord of the universe, Jesus. You know, they say that, that you, you know you've made up God when he hates all the th same things and the same people that you do. I think we know when we make Jesus what we want him to be. But here are some ways that artists, people throughout history, have painted Jesus. Whatever the cultural context you come from becomes your picture of what Jesus looks like. It's amazing. A few years ago, a bunch of preachers started deciding that you know, Jesus was too wimpy and they needed to make this manly Jesus that wasn't a wimp. It was kind of like a UFC fighter Jesus. We, we make Jesus in our mind, and it's anything other than what the Bible depicts Jesus was like. I want you to have a look at this passage. Uh, it's the other thing that makes Jesus unique. It, it, we have to ask ourselves about it. There are hundreds of Old Testament prophecies concerning what the Messiah was like, and they were like spot on. So uh, just ridiculous. We're going to go back to Isaiah 53. If you want to follow along, you can. This won't be up on the screen this time. Remember, this was like 800 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 53. We're going to begin right in the first verse. I hope you're with me. Here we go. 53 verse 1. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So right here, we're about to get why most people are going to miss him. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. <coughs> Okay, so he was not homecoming king, uh, he was not quarterback, he probably never even played football. Uh, it says he was despised and rejected by others, 
a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one who people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Does that sound like someone you, you knew in high school? Does that sound like someone you wanted to hang out with in high school? Can you relate to this? This can't be God. It's really amazing if we look at the fifth verse. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. It is amazing when we openly and intellectually look at who this person is. This, this message with my picture of Jesus. First of all, Jesus wasn't white. Who knew? Jesus was not ordained. Why did I bother going to school? I don't know. It messes with our class structures. Jesus was not rich. He was not privileged. So how does God show up? Well, many of you probably saw, years ago, the movie Bruce Almighty. And in this movie, I love it, God shows up as Morgan Freeman. I mean, God shows up as a janitor. Let's watch this little clip of it. Oh, I did that. There we are. It's good. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. No matter how filthy something gets, it always cleans it right up. You want to see a miracle, son? Be there. Wait, are you leaving? Yeah, I said that you can handle things now. Well, what if I need you? What if I have questions? That's your problem, Bruce. That's everybody's problem. You keep looking up. That's everybody's problem. You keep looking up. We're looking for God in the extraordinary instead of the ordinary, and that's why we're missing him. That's, that's why we miss him. When God shows up in the flesh... You can't make Jesus who you want him to be. You know, it's, it's so much easier to believe in a God that I can't see. I can personalize my faith and have it my way, right? I can have discipleship without a cost. I can have faith without obedience because all I have to do is be obedient to a God who approves of all the same things that I approve of anyway. But when God shows up in the flesh, I can't rationalize. I have a decision to make. I can't waver between two options. Just go to Matthew 5 with me. Go to Matthew 5. And... And this is the start of, of the Sermon on the Mount. We've, we've kind of been adjacent to this, bouncing around this since New Year's. Honestly, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the Sermon on the Mount because I so want to rationalize and reinterpret what God is telling me to do. But sometimes I want to say, like, God, you really don't mean that, right? It's like, it's, it's just a symbol or, or a metaphor. You see, up to this point, it's been all warm and fuzzy. We, we started with a series of blessings called the Beatitudes. And, you know, then he's like, you know, you're the salt of the earth. Yeah, you're the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. And we're like, yay, Jesus, right? We're feeling good. The energy is building. We're having a rally up in here. And then he carries on at verse 17 and 20, and he says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait, what, what was that, Jesus? And onward he goes. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, ha, and that's, that's a Hebrew term of contempt. Uh, you can substitute that with whatever you want. First word that came to my mind was libtard. Uh, so anyone who says to a brother or sister, ha, is answerable in court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Whoa. I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. Slow your roll there, Jesus. You, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And at this point, I would be edging towards the back of the crowd. And he keeps going, but I'm not sure I'm listening anymore. I'm too busy trying to rationalize how I don't really have to live like that. I'll just 
you know, stop at being the light of the world. That was good. I'm going to leave it there. It's kind of like the story of the rich young ruler who, who Jesus told if he wanted to be perfect, he had to sell everything and give it to the poor. So that's a tough word, perfect. In the Greek, uh, the Greek word teleos, it's the word finished, or well, or complete, or whole. He's saying if you want to be finished, if you want to be done cooking 100%, there is a huge leap past keeping just the letter of the law. You know, God's good enough is a mile past what I would consider doing really, really well. And that's what God actually desires for us. When you look through these things that Jesus is saying, this big, scary message is that how you treat people in your heart matters to God. How you speak to people that you disagree with affects your relationship with God. How we react when people attack us matters to God. I believe this is because all of those people carry the image of God, even when we can't or won't or don't want to see. And he, how he says we should treat those image bearers is hard. So what's the problem? I mean, I, I had to struggle to get my head around the reality of God. That, that's been part of my, my journey. Uh, and a lot of the claims that were made about God in the Bible, because they seem ridiculous, they seem crazy. But the main problem is not intellectual, right? The, the, main, problem, the main problem of faith is not a head problem. The main problem of faith is a heart problem. We explored this head-heart issue just a couple of weeks ago. I want you to, to we're going to take one more trip, quick, back into Scripture again, Matthew 13. Uh, you can go back there again. We're going to one verse. So if you, if you don't want to go there, you don't have to. It's going to be up on the screen. But I love it when you, you actually look for yourself at what's there. So Matthew 13, verse 15. What? It, it, here, here's how it starts. But... What what is saying? What what is it that people see they don't see? They they hear but they're not hearing. The people's hearts become callous. The real problem is hardness of heart is resistance. It's not intellectual doubt, right? This is what he says. For this people's heart, this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn. And I would heal them. Why did Jesus not heal many of the people? Because of their lack of faith. But the faith wasn't that they didn't believe. It was a calloused heart issue that wouldn't let them connect with the power of God. You see, historically, this is the purpose of Lent. This is the purpose of the Lenten season. The purpose of the Lenten season is for us to prepare ourselves For the reaffirmation of our baptismal vows. That is the historical purpose of Lent. Now, to truly be able to say again what we said then. So this is the purpose. For those of you who have been baptized, do you remember what baptism means? Baptism means dead. It means buried. It means out of the way. That it's no longer I that live, but Christ who has risen up and lives in me. And he is renewing my body. My body's not bad. He's renewing my body. He's renewing my mind. He's renewing my heart. He's opening the eyes of my heart. So as we close today, I want to hit on three things. Three critical actions that we need to focus on over the next six weeks as we seek to open the eyes of our heart towards Easter, towards the resurrection, towards Jesus. Three critical actions to open the eyes of your heart. First one, number one, is repentance. Uh, Quick definition, repentance is agreeing with God when he says things that we don't like. As long as there is any, and and this is what we are doing this Lenten season, as long as there is any area of resistance in my life, that I am saying, nope, nope, Jesus, you cannot have this one, everything else but this, There is no complete, there is no 100%. Jesus remains hidden. See, repentance is turning my back on anything that is not God. So Lent is a season of repentance. That's number one. Number two, secondly, to open the eyes of our heart requires connecting to vital Christian community. 
Christ shows up today in a new physical body. You know what, what the new physical body that Christ has assumed is? We talked about this last week. The physical body of Christ is the church. The body of Christ. This is, this is why you can't just do Jesus on an individual basis. You know that the day, on the day of resurrection, that, that Jesus appeared to his disciples that were traveling together on the road to Emmaus, and they did not recognize him. Three years with Jesus, he pops back up, they don't recognize him. They don't recognize his new resurrected body. As the disciples traveled, as they stopped that night, they invited this traveler that was Jesus to have fellowship with them and break bread together. And it was in the breaking of the bread that they recognized Jesus. So important, not, not only in this process of repentance, which is continual, but, but to be in, in vital Christian community. So on Holy Thursday, Holy Thursday, that, that's the Thursday before Good Friday, which is the Friday before Easter, if, if you're not keeping track of that, we are going to be sharing a meal and, and communion. I am not sure yet what that's going to look like, but I will tell you later. Uh, it may be gathering together here as a large group. It may be gathering as multiple small groups in people's houses to share that, that intimate meal. I will keep you up to date on that. I'm looking forward to it, though. It's, it's so important to me in, in, in my Christian life. I know I need that vital Christian connection to vital Christians to keep me going on this faith path. So, take a time of repentance. Make sure to connect with vital Christian community. And the third thing is this. The thing that's so important in our lives here that, that we just read from, from Jesus is that our relationship and connection with people whose lives don't look like our lives matter. So what, what do you mean, Pastor Aaron? I mean that Jesus did not find the outwardly best, uh, you know, most holy people and just surround himself with them and, and, and get in this holy huddle and, and, and crunch in and go. Right? Uh, we're going to talk about this more in the coming weeks, but he brought the light into the world by sharing his life with people who weren't perfect, who weren't complete. They weren't 100% done cooking. Some of them were barely even in the oven, if we're going to be honest. Like, this one is the most difficult of these three for me, because when I'm hit, whether it's physically or emotionally or on Facebook, I want to hit back. And Jesus frustrates me because he doesn't work that way. He has the kind of grace for everyone that he has for me. And then he expects me to follow suit. Jerk. Um, sorry, I'm kidding. Mostly. Um, any, right. We're coming down the home stretch. You know, this, this is it. This is what we have to think about. This next six weeks, as we go forward in this journey of faith, this Lenten journey towards Easter, it is a continual process of repentance. We need to connect to vital Christian community. And we need to be in a grace relationship with people who are not like us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.